Hey guys, welcome to lecture 2.3 where we'll be talking about the properties of carbon as an introduction to biochemistry where we'll be exploring the chemistry of life. Uh, I started off with this picture of a diamond because diamonds are made out of pure carbon and carbon is the most abundant element in the universe behind hydrogen and oxygen. So it's not quite the most abundant one, but it's pretty darn close. And it's so abundant that uh, a planet was recently discovered in 2010 that is believed to consist mostly of diamonds. So instead of having an iron core like Earth does, or a molten iron core like Earth does, it may potentially have a solid diamond core. Pretty amazing. Anyways, uh, the biochemistry is based on the chemistry of carbon. And as the question asks, what asks here, what is its carbon's atomic number? And we should all be able to look at that diagram and see that its, its atomic number is six, which means it has six uh, protons and six electrons. By looking at its mass number, which we can round off to 12, and remember we can deduce the number of neutrons by subtracting its the atomic number from the mass number. So uh, 12 minus six equals six, and there's, therefore there are six neutrons in carbon. But this makes carbon pretty darn special, and along with uh, silicon, which also has a similar valence electron configuration. What's a valence electron? Remember, that's the electrons in that outer energy shell. And so if carbon has a uh, atomic number of six with six protons and six electrons, let's take a quick peek at what its energy shells would look like. Uh, but first, we are going to look at where does carbon come from? Where do we find it in on our planet? Well, we find most of it uh, either in the atmosphere or we find it in living organisms. Now, there's a lot of ancient carbon, and what I mean by ancient carbon, this is carbon that uh, was taken out of the atmosphere and put into plants through the process of photosynthesis. And when those plants died, they were buried under sediments, and those sediments were compressed and heat was, jet was applied to them from the Earth's heat. And those became our fossil fuels, our coal, our oil, our natural gases. So when you drive your car to school in the morning, you're actually using ancient sunlight in order to get to school. So when people tell you solar power is not possible, just kind of look at them and say, it's what runs the world. Anyways, uh, as I said, most of the uh, CO2 or most of the carbon that we utilize or by plants utilize is found in the atmosphere today. And of course, we contribute to that carbon in the atmosphere by uh, the burning of these fossil fuels. So here's the picture I was going to talk about originally. And we have uh, carbon's energy shells. And you can see in the first energy shell, which has a max of two electrons, there are two electrons circling, cir uh, uh, circling the nucleus there. And in the second energy shell, we have four electrons. So we have two in the first and four in the, in the second one. That makes a total of six electrons, which is carbon's atomic number. Uh, again, the number of protons and the number of electrons. So why is this important? Well, this allows carbon to share those four electrons with four other elements. It can make four covalent bonds. And that makes carbon kind of like the Tinker Toy, or uh, you guys probably don't know what Tinker Toys are, but the connects kind of like a building block, almost like a Lego. We can put it together in a lot of different configurations because of these four valence electrons. We can form four covalent bonds. This is one of the simplest ways we can put carbon together. We can, a, a single carbon uh, atom can share its electrons with four hydrogen uh, atoms to make one of the simplest of what we call the hydrocarbons. Hydro for hydrogen, carbon for the carbon in there. 
That's all that is this molecule consists of, hydrogen and carbon. It's a hydrocarbon. And this is methane. This is gas. Okay, you produce it. Cows produce it. It is produced by um, bacteria. It is produced, it is released uh, in um, when we uh, frack, uh, do other types of um, uh, extraction of gases and oils and things like that. Methane is mostly a uh, product of living organisms, and uh, it can have a nasty smell. Anyways, this is one of the simplest of the uh, uh, or of the hydrocarbons, methane, and each one of those covalent bonds represents energy. When those bonds are broken, energy is released, and this is the reason why hydrocarbons are great forms of energy storage. All your gasoline, your oil, your coal, and things like that, all of those are hydrocarbons. And when those bonds are broken simultaneously in the process of combustion, i.e. they're burning, they release a tremendous amount of energy. These bonds are important, and how, they are bo how they, these carbon atoms are bonded to each other makes a huge difference in their structure. Remember, structure determines function. On the left-hand side, we see diamond. On the right-hand side, we see graphite. Both are composed of pure carbon. The only difference between these two is how those carbon atoms are bonded to each other. As you can see on the left-hand side, the uh, atoms of carbon are interlaced with each other, so diamond forms this crystal this uh, very strong crystal, and it's very difficult to break those bonds. Graphite, on the other hand, uh, the carbon atoms are arranged so that they form planes. As you can see, we have three planes of carbon atoms there, and graphite's very soft. That's what uh, the lead in your pencil is made up of. Of course, pencils don't use lead anymore because it's a highly toxic compound, but when you write those sheets of um, graphite uh, carbon molecules come off onto your paper. It's very soft. It's difficult to break the bonds between the individual carbon atoms, but there's no bonds between the layers of carbon atoms, and that's the big difference. We can put, the we can put carbon together in a lot of different ways. I want you to know the difference between a molecular formula and a structural formula. A molecular formula basically gives us the ratio of atoms. And as you see there, we have one carbon atom to four hydrogen atoms underneath the term molecular formula. And again, that's methane. When we look at structural formula, it gives us an idea of how they are arranged in space. Okay, uh, the diagram that's the structural formula diagram that's right below structural formula is a two dimensional diagram. Some representations of how this molecule looks in three dimensions are to the right. The one on the far right is what we call a space-filling model, and that's about the most representative of what this thing looks like, methane, in the real world. Okay, um, Because of carbon's uh, ability to form four bonds, we can put it together in a lot of different ways. If you look on the bottom, we look at, uh, we see ethane, which is a short hydrocarbon chain of consisting of two carbons and six uh, hydrogens. And then next to it, to the right, we see ethane, which is what we call an alkene. And ethane has a double bond between the two carbons because that represents uh, two electrons being shared from each one of those carbon atoms with each other. So it's two bonds there. And again, carbon can have a maximum of four bonds coming off of it. So if we count the number of bonds there, starting on the uh, left-hand side of the ethane molecule, we have one hydrogen, and we go clockwise, we have another hydrogen, and then we have the two carbon bonds. So that's a total of four bonds, one, two, three, four, for each one of those carbon molecules. And ethine, which is an alkene on the far right, you can see has a triple bond, and therefore there's only room for one more hydrogen coming off of that. And again, when a triple bonded carbon molecule is a very, very strong bond, hard to break. But when it does break, it releases a tremendous amount of energy.
let's look at this fat molecule. This is what we call a triglyceride. Tri stands for the three fatty acid tails that are coming off. That's those big, long yellow things. And look at all those hydrogen-carbon bonds. Okay, Each one of those hydrogen-carbon bonds represents energy. And that's why fat is so great at storing energy, because it has all these hydrocarbon bonds in there. Just like oil and gas consist of these long hydrocarbon tails, fat also does. And we as animals store our excess long-term energy as fat because it's very compact. And we like to move around. And so therefore, if we can, the more compactly we can store this excess energy, the easier it is for us to move around. Here's another hydrocarbon. This is a phospholipid. One of the things that um, the fat molecules and this phospholipid and hydrocarbons all have in common is that that hydrocarbon tail of both the phospholipid and the fat molecule and that big long hydrocarbon chains we'll see in oil and gas, they are all hydrophobic. Remember, hydro means water, phobia means fear, they fear water. And of course, we've already talked about uh, phospholipids and that which compose the cell membrane. They're kind of those amphipathic molecules. Amphi, remember, means what? That's right, both, and they are both hydrophilic and hydrophobic, where the head part is hydrophilic and the tail is hydrophobic. And you can see the cholesterol molecules inside the, the cell membrane. They look pretty similar to those hormones, don't they? That's because those hormones are actually built from the skeleton of a cholesterol molecule. Cholesterol is very needed. We need cholesterol. So once again, let's look at these two steroid hormones, estrogen and testosterone. And if you look at them, they look pretty much the same, except on the estradiol, we see this thing that on the far left side says HO, okay? And on the testosterone, instead of having an HO, we have just an O, an oxygen. And then if we move to the right, the testosterone has this thing that says CH3, which actually stands for a methyl group. And then we see another CH3 in the same place as we do with the estrogen and an OH group in the same place. So we only can spot a couple of differences between these two. But what a difference those that makes. One will make you a female. One will make you a male. That's a huge difference with just a very small change in that chemistry. Okay, again, we change the structure slightly. We are going to change the function. So now let's go ahead and review some of our different groups of uh, our, some of our different functional groups. You need to know what the name is, you need to know what it looks like, and you need to know what are its properties. So let's start off with the first one, hydroxyl. That's that HO or OH, okay? That's what it is. And if you look at the far left there, that red is the oxygen and the white is a hydrogen molecule. And if we look over on the far right, we see ethanol and we see the OH group on the right hand side of that molecule. The OH group gives a molecule a, a name and those are, those are our alcohols. And OL is the ending of that and you can see ethanol that is the alcohol that's present in beer and wine and whiskey and all those other things so what's the what what does this property does this give a molecule well as if you can see down there for the most part it makes the molecule polar okay and that means it's soluble in water it will mix with water it attracts water molecules because it is polar our second group that we need to talk about is what's called a carbonyl group. And our carbonyl group, as you, let's go to our uh, left-hand side picture, we see a black circle that represents a carbon atom uh, double bonded to the red one. What's the red one again? Oxygen. Okay, so we have a carbon double bonded to an, an oxygen group. And this carbonyl group can occur in one of two places. If it occurs in the middle of the molecule, as we see on the left-hand top diagram, okay, that is known as a ketone, and acetone is a simple ketone. 
if it occurs on the end of the molecule, as we see in propanol just below that, it is known as an aldehyde. Okay, and basically um, these things uh, are what we call structural isomers because uh, if you look at carefully at both acetone and propanol, you will see that they have the same number and the same type of elements. There's three carbons, one oxygen, and uh, we have um, five hydrogens in each one of these molecules. Uh, so the structural, uh, the molecular formula is gonna be the same. It would be C3, H5O for both of those, but the structural formula is going to be different as we see there. Our next group we want to talk about is the carboxyl group. And this is a really important one because it, prov it basically makes a molecule an acid. Okay, so let's look at the left hand diagram again. We see a black carbon double bonded to a oxygen, and then also uh, onto that carbon, we see a hydroxyl group, an OH group, with the red oxygen and the white hydrogen. That is a carboxyl group. And if we look over on the right-hand side, we see acetic acid, which is vinegar. And again, remember acids have an acid taste, or, okay, or sour taste, I should say. And that's what gives, um, uh, vinegar, it's sour taste. Now let's look down on the bottom. Okay, we see acetic acid on the left-hand side. And when acetic acid, when that hydrogen comes off of the oxygen and forms the acetate ion, that makes a solution more acidic. Why? Because it has increased the proton concentration in that particular solution. And that's what acids do. They increase the proton concentration when that proton when that hydrogen disassociates from the acetic acid and forms the acetate ion another group we want to talk about is the amino group and there we see over on the right hand side we see the blue uh, circle that is the symbol for nitrogen and it has two uh, hydrogens coming off of that that kind of grayish white uh, balls coming off of that and we're going to be very, we're going to come across a lot of these amino groups when we talk about proteins, because the proteins are made up of amino acids. And if we look on the far uh, right hand side, the deck diagram of glycine, glycine is an amino acid. Okay, it's one of the building blocks of protein. And what other functional group can you see on the glycine molecule? That's right, there's a carboxyl group on the left hand side there okay so amino acid the amino part comes from the amine group and the acid part comes from the carboxylic acid so this one can do uh, amino groups are kind of interesting because they act as a base and if you look at the bottom diagram you can see the non-ionized form is nh2 but then it can pick up a proton and become positive, it becomes ionized because it's now has a charge, it's now an ion. But because it picked up a proton, it reduced the proton concentration of the solution and it acted as a base because it reduced that proton concentration. Another group we want to talk about are the sulfhydryls. What's sulfhydryl? It kind of looks kind of like an OH group, doesn't it? Except instead of having an oxygen, it has a sulfur. That's that big yellow ball on the, on the left-hand side. And sulfhydro groups are important because they help to give uh, stability to proteins. Don't worry about that right now. We'll talk about that real soon. But I do want you to know that they can form a covalent bond with another amino acid that has a sulfhydro group and they help provide, again, uh, structure and stability. And these are known as thiols. And uh, we'll move on. Another group I wanna talk about, this one's really super important, the phosphate groups. And phosphates are, as you can see, we have a phosphate molecule, that kind of light and yellowish thing surrounded by a bunch of oxygens. And phosphates are extremely important because they 
play a role in the transfer of energy okay, between organic molecules. And we'll be talking about one in particular, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Okay, so the major role that these guys play is in um, the transfer of energy. And see all those negative charges on those oxygens? Phosphates give a molecule an overall a negative charge. DNA has tons of phosphates, and overall DNA is negatively charged.